And so what concerns me now is, even if you're as brilliant as Newton, you reach a point where you start basking in the majesty of God, and then your discovery stops. It just stops. You're kind of no good anymore for advancing that frontier, waiting for somebody else to come behind you who doesn't have God on the brain, and who says, that's a really cool problem, I want to solve it. They come in and solve it. But look at the time delay. This was a hundred year time delay. And the math that's in perturbation theory is like crumbs for Newton. He could have come up with that. The guy invented calculus just on a dare, practically. When someone asked him, why, why, you know, you know, Ike, how come planets orbit in ellipses and not some other shape? And he couldn't answer that. He goes home for two months, comes back, out comes integral differential calculus, because he needed that to answer that, to answer that question. And so, so this, is, this is the kind of mind we were dealing with with Newton. He could have gone there, but he didn't. He didn't. His religiosity stopped him. And so we're left with the, real, the, the realization, of course, that intelligent design, while real in the history of science, while real in the presence of sort of philosophical drivers, is nonetheless a philosophy of ignorance. And so regardless of what our political agenda is, all you have to say is science is a philosophy of discovery, intelligent design is a philosophy of ignorance. That's all. I don't need to see whether, I don't need, have you discovered anything lately? If not, get out of the science classroom. But I'm not gonna say, don't teach this, because it's, it's real, it happened. So I don't want people to sweep it under the rug, because if you do, you're neglecting something fundamental that's going on in people's minds when they confront things they don't understand. And it happens to the greatest of the minds as it happens to everyone else, many, if not most other people in the public. I think that all the ontological arguments for the existence of God were overthrown a long time ago. In fact, were overthrown well before Darwin and Einstein. Uh, but that now, which is why I gave the example I did give, now that we do have a rough idea of the age and origin of our species and of our cosmos, that it simply isn't possible for religion to do the reverse engineering it once did. No one would uh, believe in this stuff if they started off knowing where we came from and, and how. Uh, it's just it has the advantage of being the first and the worst explanation uh, for uh, because we are we are pattern seeking primates and that's a good thing obviously it gives us the itch of curiosity and innovation but it also means that we will prefer very often a conspiracy theory or a junk theory to no theory at all so that's the the, the epistemological question that has to be resolved and I, I believe that we've succeeded in doing that. No, I prefer to argue that it would be horrible if it were true. I mean, I'm not an atheist, in other words, I'm an anti-theist. I, I don't, in myself, have any desire to live under a permanent, unalterable dictatorship. I don't, I don't wish it was true that I could be convicted of thought crime for what I was thinking when I was asleep, <laughs> let alone for what I was thinking when I was awake. <laughs> And um, I don't wish for, an, uh, for a dictatorship I know I had no part in choosing that would not cease to torment me uh, after I had died. I mean, I've actually been to all three of the axis of evil countries, the, and some other countries too, where the citizen is the permanent property of the state. When I was in um, a Christian prep school, I used to wonder what heaven would be like if it really did consist of everlasting praise. <laughs> Sounded like hell to me. <laughs> But, but I couldn't picture it, and nobody can, of course, but I've seen the nearest approximation to it, which is North Korea, where the, it is the only duty and job and right of a citizen to eternally praise the divine leader and his divine father. I'll uh, expatiate it a little, if you like. North Korea is only one short of a trinity. <laughs> but Kim Jong-il is only the head of the, of the party and the army. He's not the head of the state. The head, the head of the state is his dead father, dead for 15 years. It's a necrocracy. <laughs> Or I tried this, a thanatocracy, a morsalocracy. And, and it's, what, it's a life of constant groveling misery and fear and praise and thanks for the tiny handouts that you get. It's impossible to describe the nothingness of the life of a North Korean. But at least you can fucking die and leave North Korea. <laughs> And with, with religious totalitarianism, there is no escape. It is absolute, it's complete, it's utter, it's horrifying. 
Now, I say freely, non servia. I don't want that, and I don't respect anyone who does. So if they could prove it was true, I'd say you have all your work still ahead of you. <laughs> but what a good thing it is that there's no evidence at all for such an obscene proposition. There. Uh, well, what's your personal opinion? You know, put you on the spot I'm, a little I'm bit. I'm a scientist, so I say I go where the evidence goes, mm -hmm. not what I personally I would like what to What is the evidence I, as you interpret it? I would love to believe. Your theory. I would love to believe that there was a God who made us, who's looking out for us. And loves us. Loves us. We need takes love. Takes care of us. And Makes because us we're, because, guides us and because keeps we're in us. Because such a mess. We're doing That's things so wrong. Then we would be relieved of the responsibility of taking care of ourselves. The voice would come from up above and, and say, say, Don't stop pollute the just stop the chlorofluorocarbons. Right. That's right. But that does not seem to be the case. We have to solve our own problems. We have to solve our own problems. Now, on the question of the origin of life, uh, there's been some very interesting progress made. Uh, on the early Earth, there are two different ways in which the stuff of life, the, the molecules that lead to life, are made. One, it seems very clear, it was made in the primitive atmosphere, lightning, ultraviolet light falling on the Earth, that kind of stuff. And the other way is, it fell from the skies. Because at the time of the origin of the Earth, comets, a lot of debris was being swept up. The, the solar system was a lot, uh, a lot more traffic in it than there is now. And a lot of that debris we know from the uh, exploration of Halley's Comet, for example, comets are very rich in organic matter. So the stuff of life was falling on the Earth. Now, is that the hand of God or not? Well, if you believe in God, God established the, the physical laws of the universe, and chemistry is a consequence of physics, so all those molecules that led to life were made by, by God. It's possible to believe that. I, I'm not opposed to that idea, but I just say there is no evidence for it. And where there's no evidence, I say keep an open mind. Don't commit yourself in the absence of compelling evidence. I do spend probably a little bit more time than I should on on religion, and uh, I have a certain amount of hostility to uh, to it. Uh, I think the most rational reason for it is because of the harm that I see it does. We were talking about that earlier. Uh, many people do simply awful things out of sincere religious belief, not using religion as a cover, uh, the way Saddam Hussein may have done but really because they believe that this is what God wants them to do. Going all the way back to Abraham being willing to sacrifice Isaac because God told him to do that. Putting God ahead of humanity is a terrible thing. I, I simply didn't think of myself as an atheist. Uh, I didn't use the word, I mean, I, in the same way that I don't think of myself as a non-astrologer. You know, I don't, no one has to wake up in the morning and repudiate astrologer, uh, astrology by accepting the identity as a non-astrologer. Uh, and there's no one who, who you know, n virtually no one believes in Zeus, and we haven't defined ourselves in opposition to paganism. We're not non-pagans. Um, and I think it's also useful to point out that every devout Christian stands in the same relationship to Hinduism or to, to Islam as I do. I mean, the Christians look at what's going on in, in Muslim discourse. They look at the claim that the Quran is the perfect word of the creator of the universe, and they are not persuaded. And that's all, that's all my atheism consists of. I'm, I'm not persuaded by the, these patently ridiculous claims. And I am persuaded by the evidence that these people are part of a, a culture that is designed to uh, not look critically at its own discourse. Uh, and so Christians can see that of Islam. They can point out the errors of thinking there. They just don't point it out in Christianity. Um, so the, uh, from my point of view, I, I don't think this is where I may differ from some of my colleagues. I, I don't think the word atheism ultimately is, is necessary or even useful. And I think it's actually, uh, in the end, harmful uh, because it, it uh, re the rejection of absurdity is much bigger than atheism. I mean, it, it is science. You know, it, reason is much bigger than atheism. And uh, having standards of evidence and argument is much bigger than atheism. And, and that's all we need to repudiate most of what, peop what most people do most of the time in the name of, of religion.
human civilization began by putting purpose and, and, and intelligent purpose behind gods associated with the sun, the moon, the planets, the wind, the earth, the oceans. There, it's been by one estimate over a thousand different gods throughout human history. Mars, God of War, Poseidon, Thor, all the rest. And the really important thing is that all of you, or almost all of you probably, are now atheists regarding those gods. Just, the only difference is it's just one that we may disagree about. But 999, we all agree, have been thrown out. And the reason they've been thrown out is they've been buried by the rise of our physical understanding. Science works. And the fact that science works has buried the gods of the wind and the sun and the moon. Farmers now, as I was just saying, when it, when it doesn't rain, they don't pray for rain anymore. They go see a meteorologist. And that's a good thing. In the process, the human condition has improved immensely, and it will continue to improve as science continues to bury the one remaining God. Now, this one God is supposedly left. We might ask a priori or in advance, how, how likely is in advance that, that all those other 999 gods were false, but this one's true? Well, you might argue if you had a flat prior that it's probably pretty small likelihood. But it doesn't really matter. The point is that our current understanding of nature has changed. We've learned things. It's changed and developed since the claims were made by Iron Age peasants who didn't even know the Earth orbited the Sun. And therefore, it's natural that science is inconsistent with those claims based on ignorance. And we shouldn't revere those ancient claims as sacred. They're ignorant. There's still many open questions. I'll try my one, my 10 seconds of humility to be the only time tonight. There's a lot we don't know about the universe, a lot more we don't know than we do. That's the wonder of science, that's why I'm a scientist. But it is intellectually lazy to just stop asking questions and stop looking for physical explanations and just say God did it. Perhaps the greatest discovery in human history, one that is logically prior to every other discovery, is that all of our traditional sources of belief are in fact generators of error and should be dismissed as sources of knowledge. These include faith, Revelation, dogma, authority, charisma, augury, prophecy, intuition, clairvoyance, conventional wisdom, and that warm, invigorating glow of subjective certainty. How then can we know? Other than by proving mathematical and logical theorems, which are not about the material world, the answer is the process that Karl Popper called conjecture and refutation. We come up with ideas about the nature of reality, and this uh, involves the combinatorial powers of human cognition that uh, Tom mentioned in his kind introduction. And then we test those ideas against that reality, allowing the world to falsify the mistaken ones. We know that the belief systems of all the world's traditional religions and cultures, their theories of the origins of life, humans, and societies, are factually mistaken. We know, but our ancestors did not, that humans belong to a single species of African primate that developed agriculture, government, and writing late in its history. We know that our species is a tiny twig of a genealogical tree that embraces all living things and that emerged from prebiotic chemicals almost four billion years ago. We know that we live on a planet that revolves around one of a hundred billion stars in our galaxy, which is one of a hundred billion galaxies in a 13.8 billion year old universe, possibly one of a vast number of universes. We know that our intuitions about space, time, matter, and causation are incommensurable with the nature of reality on scales that are very large and very small. We know that the laws governing the physical world, including accidents, disease, and other misfortunes, have no goals that pertain to human well-being. That is, there is no such thing as fate, providence, karma, spells, curses, augury, divine retribution, or answered prayers, though the discrepancy between the laws of probability and the workings of cognition may explain why so many people believe there are. And we know that we did not always know these things, that the beloved convictions of every time and culture may be decisively falsified, doubtless including some we hold today. It seems to me that those people who have their faith, 
who believe so strongly in God, if they really believe strongly in their God, if they believe they're right, they believe that they, they, are, they occupy the moral high ground, they should be only too willing to sit down and put this, not to the scientific test, but to the political moral discussion test of talking about why they believe what they believe, and let's talk about, the main thing we want to talk about is what should we do? What, what's the moral course of action to take? And if that is to be a reasonable discussion, we have to take a few cards off the table. Such as? The faith card. What we have mean? to take the faith card off the table. What do you mean take the faith card off the table? I mean, if, 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 if one is a man of faith, one can't take, the, can't take the gene out. Well, you know, Lucille says you're wrong. You, you know who Lucille is? Mm -mm. She's a friend of mine. She's always right. I can't play that card in an argument. If I, it's just rude of me to say, you know, Lucille says you're wrong. You say, well, who's Lucille? I say, well, friend of mine, always right. But we're End of the discussion. But, but we're confronted today by people who say they know the mind of God. And, and I, think the, scripture and to I think it. And I think the way we should deal with them is to say, well, that's very interesting because now you've got a real problem. Since the rest of us don't know the mind of God, we can't share your... Uh, your direct line, so you're going to have to do the best you can in a secular discussion about what the right thing to do is. You Are you up to the task of explaining to the rest of us who don't have your hotline to God why you're right? The question is not whether individual people who happen to be religious or who happen not to be religious are good or bad. Uh, the question is whether religion itself is. I think there are aspects of religion which are bad in, in themselves. I think that the idea of blind faith, believing something without evidence, and sheltering behind the right to hold faith, uh, such that you can justify doing bad things because your religion, your faith tells you it's the right thing to do. Many, many good and righteous people who believe themselves to be good and righteous have done terrible things precisely because they believe that they're doing it for their God. So faith, blind faith, can have that bad effect. Uh, for myself as a scientist, I'm accustomed to saying that the thing that I really object to about religion is that it teaches us to be satisfied with not understanding teaches us to be satisfied with pseudo-explanations which are really not explanations at all. Things that sound good. <laughs> Things that sound like an explanation but which really aren't, which appeal to the emotions but don't actually explain anything. So I think that religion in that sense can be the enemy of science, the enemy of truth. But this evening I'm reflecting more that what may really be the enemy of truth and the enemy of science is willful obscurantism, whether it comes from religion or not. You all know who this girl is? Look at this child. Is this the face of a demon? Or is this the look of a skeptic who's not buying your bullshit? <laughs> the problem is it's the same glare either way. And that's why we're lumped in together. This is the way we look when we realize we're being lied to. When you realize that all of the fables in the Bible began as began in the hearts of superstitious primitives who just made it up. It's man-made mythology and there is no truth in it. There's no heaven, no hell, no Eden either, and there is no devil. He was invented by Persians, adapted by Jews, and embellished by Christians. He was never the serpent, nor a fallen angel, and he can't steal your soul because we don't have souls. Exorcism isn't real because demons aren't real, because magic isn't real. We are not cursed. We are not fallen. We have arisen and we don't need salvation because God literally doesn't give a damn what happens after you die. Because then, neither of you exist. There is no goddamn devil because there is no God. Damn! You just die and that's it. You're not immortal. You're not eternal. And to believe otherwise is to diminish everything that you really have. Life is precious because it is short and there's nothing after it.
There's no destiny, and there's no purpose beyond what you give it yourself. If you want your life to mean something, try making someone else's life meaningful. <laughs> Thank you. Because regardless, whatever else you believe, history will be our judge.